Hello there, listeners. This is an audio recording of my book, The West Wind Tales of Sword and Sand, which is book one in the West Wind Tales series. If you like what you hear, consider subscribing, leaving a like or a comment, or preferably all of the above. If you want more content like this, consider supporting the channel by purchasing my book on Amazon, becoming a channel member by clicking the join button, or preferably both. So sit back, relax, grab a cup of tea, and enjoy the chapter. Chapter 4. Du Olmasti, The Wildkin Edmund and Jupe sat at the dining table, enjoying a hearty breakfast of fried eggs and oatmeal. Mugs of hot coid steamed between them, sending a pleasant aroma through the house. Edmund had spent the night in a deep sleep that was mercifully devoid of dreams. He woke that morning to the sound of Jupe knocking on the door. It was just after sunrise. Edmund told Jupe what he remembered. He had kept the rest of the memories to himself. The border war with the mountain elves had taken place almost 500 years ago. Edmund was still trying to make sense of it himself. He remembered reading somewhere that the Ninth Legion had been wiped out, the only survivor being a page boy who had run for two days straight to warn the army in the south. Any second-rate historian could tell you the events that followed. The Northland King made the Ninth Legion into war martyrs, rallying his troops behind their standard. They pushed north with a vengeance, decimating the mountain elf clans. The surviving mountain elves migrated south, away from the White Mountains. It was believed that they were trying to reach the Lumbar Mountains above the Southlands, but none knew if they actually made it. What historians did know was that the Asherites were their descendants, the nomadic slavers who plied their trade throughout the Northlands. While slavery was frowned upon and even outlawed within certain fiefdoms, it was not strictly outlawed throughout the entire kingdom. Slavers caught within the borders of the Galehammer's fief were oftentimes executed, or at least thrown into the dungeons to be forgotten about. The other, more easterly fiefs tended to look the other way when it came to slavery. To them, it was too valuable of a trading commodity. Their markets were too far from the western seas to make a profit from the trade ships, and caravans of traders that reached into the Eastlands were much too rare to harass them with restrictions upon their goods. Edmund had molded the details over in his head, over and over again. He knew those memories had been his. He knew that he was Edmund, the one called Stormhand. He didn't remember dying. He remembered well the excruciating pain of the bolts punching through his chest. He remembered coughing blood onto the ground from his lungs. But he did not specifically remember dying. He had survived. Somehow. I need more pieces to this puzzle. Edmund thought, but it seems that the more I discover, the more confused I become. His spoon grated across the bottom of his bowl as he finished. Grabbing his coid, which was cooling off toward room temperature, he swigged the last of the bitter drink from the bottom of the mug and set it back on the table with a satisfied sigh. His memory would have to wait. There was work to be done, and Jupe had promised to help him remember after the crops had been reaped. "'What do you say, Ed?' said Jupe, who had also finished. "'You ready?' Edmund nodded and stood up from the table, following Jupe out the door. Edmund had thrown on some work clothes from the dresser in the guest room. He wore a tan linen shirt tucked into his trousers, which were tightened around his waist by a stained leather belt. At the small of his back hung his knife in a sheath that Jupe had given him that morning before breakfast. His trousers were dark, made from a patchwork of leather at the knees and soft wool. Over his shirt he wore a snug leather jerkin that stretched just below his waist prevented the cool morning breeze from chilling him. The entire outfit felt familiar. He rolled his sleeves up to his elbows and breathed in the crisp morning air. Leaves were falling around them as they walked past the barn out to the field behind Jupe's house. The sun was peeking over the treetops, sending warm, comforting rays of light throughout the foliage around them. As the two of them marched along the dirt path, their feet kicked up fallen leaves and crunched through twigs and debris on the ground. A light breeze rustled through the canopy, bringing with it a low murmur from the Morgan River just to the east. Jupe led them to a clearing that shone with a golden glow as the morning sunbeams hit the ripened grain that stood there. After a brief planning session, the two men went to work on the field. Edmund started with the scythe, since it required twisting of the upper body. Even though Jupe claimed that his back was feeling better this morning than it was last night, they both agreed that it would be better not to take unnecessary chances. Jupe followed behind Edmund and bound the stalks with twine, 
standing them up on their ends to further dry until they could be threshed and stored in the barn. The morning passed and the sun shone noon in the sky, then began to sink lower and lower. Edmund leaned on the scythe handle and breathed heavily. He had removed his leather jerkin and his linen shirt, and his chest glistened with sweat. Jupe had not spoken a word about the scars that covered Edmund's body. The breeze that had kept them cool during the morning hours had settled to little more than a whisper. There had been little shade in the middle of the field to protect the two of them from the midday sun. However, as noon turned to evening, the shadows stretched from the western edge out into the middle of the field, east toward Rockford. They had finished cutting the whole of the field, and had decided to take a breather for dinner before they gathered the bundled wheat into the barn. Jupe had gone back to the house to retrieve some food that he had prepared that morning. Edmund stayed in the field. It had a calming effect on one's mind. The back and forth swinging of the scythe, and the ring of the blade as it sliced through the stalks, helped him set his thoughts straight. He closed his eyes and breathed deeply. The air, still crisp and dry, had a wonderful scent of leaves and wood floating throughout it that brought with it the subtle memories of warm drinks and harsh mulling spices. Edmund tensed. There was something else on the air, something subtle, hidden, yet distinct against the natural smells of the forest around him. He grabbed the scythe in both hands, spread his legs in a firm stance in the cut stalks beneath his feet. Alert and ready, he inhaled again, smelling the air around him. There it was again, a soft, earthy smell, mixed with a musky undertone. Edmund grinned and relaxed his grip on the scythe. Olma. Laying the scythe next to him at his feet, he scanned the tree line behind the cut wheat. Now that he knew what to look for, it would only take a little... There they were. Keeping his eyes on the eastern tree line, Edmund placed both fists on his waist and cocked his head back with a quick, jerking motion. Greetings, wildkin, he called. How does the forest treat you? He had always thought that the traditional greeting of the Olma, the wildkin, was odd, but then so were the wildkin themselves. Unlike human salutations, which included a show of weakness from those involved, such as a handshake or a bow of the head, the Olma greeting involved displays of strength, and oftentimes a challenge of some sort. Edmund, to be safe, had included both. He couldn't remember the last time he had contact with the Olma, yet he knew the traditional greetings, the workings of their societies, even specific cultures within individual clans. Considering the last memory of his was over 400 years old, he hoped that traditions had not changed too drastically. The jerk of the head was considered to be a challenge if done while making eye contact with another. For the show of strength, Edmund had squared his shoulders and tightened his muscles. He hoped that the combination of being shirtless and working all morning in the sun would help give him an intimidating look. A voice called from the shade beyond the cut wheat at the edge of the field. She treats us as any other animal within her borders. Two figures emerged from the cover of the trees and advanced through the field towards Edmund. She tries to kill us at every turn. The two Olma were tall long-legged. In the lead was a female who covered the ground between them in quick, predatory strides, stopping in front of Edmund. They looked each other over. She stood a full head taller than Edmund, and from the midst of her braided hazel hair grew a pair of deer-like antlers, sharp and pointed, yet elegant, with beads and feathers tied to them in decoration. Her large, piercing eyes were a deep forest green, with flecks of gold around the irises. The tips of her ears were long and pointed, sticking out backward a good six inches from the sides of her head. Her lips were full and twisted into a frown as she stared down her nose at Edmund. Aside from the obvious difference of the ears and antlers, the Olma were quite similar to the wood elves who lived in the Northwoods and Eastlands, though only a fool would actually tell them this. Standing with her back straight and her shoulders thrown back, she was every bit as formidable as the male who stood behind her. She lacked any softness in her features, and her muscular shoulders were evident beneath her sleeveless green and brown tunic. Her arms hung loosely at her sides, and were as sculpted as Edmund's own, though not as large. She reached out a hand and touched his midsection with her fingers, tracing up toward his chest. Shivers ran up Edmund's back, and he inhaled sharply before he could stop himself. The Alma's frown broke into a grin as she noticed his reaction to her probing fingers. She quickly shifted her hand to his left shoulder, and shoved, throwing him off balance. His feet tangled around the handle of the scythe, tripping him backward onto the ground. Behind her, the male Olma burst out into huffs of booming laughter. You know our ways, little brother, she said, her gaze still lingering on his muscular frame. I am Willow of the Eastern Witchwood. The buck behind me is my brother, Oak Farseer. 
At this, she gestured back at the male Ulma, who was still chuckling. His antlers were as large as an elk's, covered with scrapes and chipped edges. He nodded in the head-cocking fashion of the wild king and called out, By what name does the forest call you, little silver eyes? Edmund smiled and struggled to his feet. He looked past Willow, whose eyes still wandered across his muscles, and greeted Oak with the same head nod and said, Man calls me Edmund. He hesitated. Stormhand. The forest has yet to give me a name. Oak grunted and moved up past his sister. He was similarly dressed and considerably broader in his stature. A small braided beard grew from his chin, though his lips and cheeks were bare. Both Ulma carried large packs on their backs, most likely filled with goods to be traded in town or brought back to their tribe. Ulma usually traveled lightly. Stormhand? asked Willow, who inched closer and was now curiously running her fingers through Edmund's hair. You carry a warrior's name, Edmund? Ugh, your man name is strange, not natural. She cupped his chin in her hand and brought his gaze up to meet hers. You need a forest name, little Silver Eyes. We have come to meet Ember. Noticing the blank look in Edmund's eyes, she added, But I suppose you would know him by his man name. What was it? She let go of Edmund's chin and absentmindedly ran her hand down his chest. Her mouth began to work. J- uh, Joop? Taking a subtle step away from her hands, Edmund began to speak when a voice called out from behind him. Ho, oh, wildkin! Edmund took another step backward out of the reach of Willow's long arms and turned to see Jupe emerge from the tree line with a bulging knapsack slung over his shoulder and a large bottle in his hands. How has the forest been treating you two? Oak barked a breathy laugh and called back in a deep, rumbling voice. She treats us poorly these last weeks. A roof over our head tonight, along with a warm fire, would be appreciated. Willow looked up at Jupe and smiled deeply. It is good to see you again, Ember. We return at last, westward from the eastern wilds. We have goods to trade for your hospitality. Jupe, who had made his way up to the three of them, unstoppered the bottle and thrust it good-naturedly into Oak's large hands. A strong scent of spiced stout wafted to Edmund's nostrils. All I ask from you two is news from the Eastlands and the Sheathwater territories. Wildkin are always welcome beneath my roof, you two most of all. Though I can't promise you a whole lot of room, he gestured with his head at Edmund, who had maneuvered himself behind Jupe, away from Willow. I am already sharing my hearth with someone. Oak took a long swig from the bottle and sighed deeply. We have been on the trail for a long while, Ember, my friend. Besides, he nodded to Willow, who was peering hungrily over Jupe's shoulder at Edmund. I don't think my sister will mind the lack of privacy. Jupe, noticing for the first time the way that Willow was acting, chuckled and said, No, I don't suppose she will. Willow turned to Jupe. Little Silver Eyes caught our scent almost before we saw him in the field. I like him. I will buy him from you. We can haggle out the price once we are inside. She moved around Jupe and started toward the house, giving Edmund's hair a tug as she passed him. Jupe grinned at Edmund and poked him in the ribs. Don't worry, he said. She's only joking. Then frowned. I... I think... Smiling again, he glanced up at Oak, who was taking another swig from the bottle in his hand. Come on, then. The crops can wait in the field until tomorrow. As the group moved back toward Jupe's house, Edmund caught a flicker of movement on the eastern corner of the field. Dismissing it as shadows, he hurried to follow the others, who were chatting like old friends. Oak and Jupe were walking next to each other, while Willow led several steps ahead, keeping her distance from Jupe. They reached the house and went inside as the sun was edging closer and closer to the top of the trees. The two Olma gently set their packs down near the table, and Jupe set about starting a fire in the iron stove. Edmund, tying his jerkin back on over his shirt, was moving toward his room to remove his boots, when Jupe grabbed his elbow and pulled him over to a cupboard near the stove. He had a small tin in his hands that was filled with an incredibly strong-smelling salve. Better put some of this under your nose. It'll help block out Willow's scent. It can be difficult to keep a level head around her. Believe me, I know. Edmund frowned. I, I don't smell anything. He glanced over at Willow and Oak, who were busy rummaging through their packs. I mean, she smelled pleasant, sort of like the understory of a thick forest, but nothing that would be trailed off. Jupe was staring at him with a puzzled look in his eyes. Jupe grunted, scratching his chin. Hmm, the scent of a female Ulma is a potent thing, especially this time of year. It can drive an intelligent man to do... Uh, less than intelligent things. The instincts it stirs in you are difficult to resist. It can take years for a man to build up a tolerance to it. I wear this stuff whenever Ulma stay at my house. I suppose that explains why Willow seems so taken with you. You aren't affected by her scent, and she's curious. 
He capped the tin and stroked at his jaw and thought, Another clue to your past, I guess. He smiled at Edmund and replaced the tin in the cupboard. Let's think about this tomorrow, shall we? Tonight, I'm going to squeeze every bit of news from those two that I can. He began to move past Edmund and then turned and said, When you get a moment, would you draw some water from the well and bring it in? Edmund nodded and grabbed the water pail from beneath the sink next to the stove and headed outside into the cool air. The well was located snugly between the barn and the house. There was a trough next to it for bear. Edmund hoisted up a full bucket of water and poured it into the pail. Sticking a cupped hand into the bucket, Edmund brought some clear, cold water up to his mouth and tasted it. The water had a pleasant, earthy flavor to it. Taking deep breaths of the autumn air, Edmund looked around himself. The woods were colored brilliantly. Oranges, yellows, reds, and flecks of lingering green seemed to have a glow about them that spoke of a wild beauty. Those same colors littered the ground among the tree line at the edges of the paths that were scattered around Jupe's property. The leaves whispered as small gusts of wind flowed through the forest. Beneath the canopy, shadows were growing as the evening wore on, giving the forest a mysterious feel that filled Edmund with a sense of longing. The desire to run headlong into the forest, to keep running and never stop, to drink on all fours from streams and rivers, to sleep under the stars in a nest of leaves and grass, to howl at the moonlight beneath the clear evening sky. Edmund shivered. It was a strange feeling, utterly untamed and profoundly wild. He gripped the brick edge of the well to steady himself. Taking a few deep breaths, he grabbed the pail and walked back to the house. Watching him unnoticed from the branches of a birch tree close by, a black owl ruffled its feathers. Well, that wraps up part one. Make sure you tune in for part two later this week. But in the meantime, leave a comment and a like. If you can't wait for part two, then you can head on over to Amazon and purchase the full-length book there. Or you can click on the link down below. I'll see you all next time. But until then, enjoy the adventure.